So welcome to another session of uh, Hatch Global. Um, today we've got uh, Arvind Gupta uh, from India, and uh, I'll give you a little introduction about Arvind in a few minutes. Um, ha Jeevan is going to just give an um, explanation about the partners today. Okay. Um, yes, I'll start with Hatch. Hatch is a place for innovation, growth, and collaboration. Uh, we are the center of, center of gravity for all things startup and the home for hungry entrepreneurs. Um, the vision of Hatch is to transform the business culture by providing genuine opportunities for entrepreneurs to experiment freely, acquire knowledge, collaborate deeply, and try successfully as a community in a creative space. Um, we believe that we have built a space that encourages budding entrepreneurs to incubate, collaborate, and accelerate. Um, I'll also, should I introduce B BYLC Ventures as well? Yes, please. Um, BYLC Ventures was created to help passionate young founders get kickstarted with their big ideas. We do this by providing technical support to validate a product or solution and seed funding to go fast to market. They also provide a set of acceleration support, including a plug and play commercial space to work from customized business training led by a successful CEO turned mentors and a suite of professional support, such as legal accounting and corporate governance. And our other two partners um, are uh, Seed Ventures, uh, Pakistan's social entrepreneurship and equity development organization. They work to support and promote entrepreneurship across various landscapes and verticals, including startups, universities, and school children. Uh, we also are partnered by Pro Pakistani, is a Pakistan's largest independent publisher for tech, business, and other news, with over 150 million traffic on its site. So Arvind Gupta, um, to introduce him, um, I probably need the whole of this uh, program to introduce him. But uh, Aravind uh, is an um, uh, innovation evangelist, technology entrepreneur, and a policy advisor. Uh, he is the head and co-founder of, of In Digital India Foundation, a policy think tank working in areas such as digital inclusion, smart cities, internet governance, data privacy, cybersecurity, to say a few. He's also a professor at IIT teaching data and digital economy. Arvind has over 27 years of experience with diverse sectors all the way from India to the Silicon Valley. And he is con his has considerable experience in consumer, internet, digital uh, media, payment system. In fact, he was one of the top 100, lists, um, 100 listed in the influences of fintech, um, the global fintech. In his last role, he was a CEO of MyGov, an initiative of, the Prime, of uh, Prime Minister uh, Sri Narendra Modi uh, to empower citizens of India with participative governance and digitally communicate schemes and policies to all Indians. He led also the digital and social media communication campaigns for uh, Mr. Modi, which resulted in Mr. Modi uh, having, uh, creating electoral history in achieving his mission uh, with over 272 seats. He's a member of many um, councils and uh, also he is on this, uh, has been supportive of NASCOM in India and one of the active members there. And he is also an entrepreneur. So he has an extremely large degree of knowledge for all the way from government to private sector to policy as well. Arvind, thank you very much for joining us. He's also a good friend of mine. And uh, I appreciate you taking time to speak to um, all four countries today. South Asia is in a different place. Today, and I think some of the learnings that you're going to share with us would be uh, very useful for all our listeners. Uh, thank you, Nathan and Jeevan, for having me here. Um, and uh, Nathan, forget to mention, uh, forgot to mention that we both are Eisenhower Fellows. We were on a call about an hour ago. Uh, uh, with our uh, Eisenhower community uh, in South Asia and the U.S. So, uh, yeah, always nice to be here. Um, and uh, I have uh, actually physically been to your uh, center in Palumbo. Um, very impressed with the hacks, uh, you know, accelerator slash incubation center there. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think... Uh, uh, it, because this is being live streamed to so many people across uh, South Asia, I will take the first few minutes, uh, if you permit me, to uh, to talk about, um, in general, the digital infrastructure India has been building and our experience with that and how it has been boosting our digital economy. 
uh, whether we are in a post covid regime already or not i don't know uh, because we seem to be peaking at least here in india we are still not reached the peak we are on a curve upwards like most of the south asian countries so um, if you permit me i have a few slides to show and then we can go into um, you know the the session and question answers and i'll be happy to answer anything from all aspects of life sure please please go ahead I Arvind, mean, that'll be perfect. And also, all the people who are listening in, if you could just uh, uh, say where you're from um, and what you do and which country you're um, uh, representing. And also, um, if you have any questions, please do put it in the chat box or any other on the Facebook page as well. Arvind, the floor is all yours. Yeah, so um, if you can see the slides, uh, uh, what, uh, what the slide deck is showing is, um, uh, is the is a movement towards um, uh, a very interesting um, creation of public-private infrastructure in India. Um, I have written extensively about it, but the reason for why India started uh, building what is called the India stack or the Aadhaar stack, which is the identity stack in India, and how it has become the foundation for all innovation in our, in our digital economy is what I'm going to just quickly go over. Um, India, you know, as most of the countries had a lot of gaps, we didn't have a national identity system, uh, either, um, either a digital or non-digital system, multiple identity cards for anything. And um, the government felt that there is, you know, if they spend $100 on public service delivery, they, the final beneficiary is only receive $15 out of this. So how do you plug the gaps? Uh, one of the key things to do was to bring out a, a, a common digital layer, uh, pay, uh, uh, identity layer for every Indian. And, and basically we made a choice 2010, 11 timeframe to basically have a digital identity verified by biometrics. And what that ensured is that not, you know, no Indian citizen or even a resident could have uh, a duplicate identity. And uh, after extensive deduping, you issue a number which is, uh, which is then verifiable biometrically. And that's the base of the platform, the digital platform India has built. And I'll explain uh, in a very fast manner how this is being used and uh, you know, where it has come of use. But the, the core lesson in India's digital economy has been that um, it, we have built our platform uh, keeping in mind the bottom of the pyramid. You see any country's income pyramid, um, whether it's the US, India, you know, Europe, it's, it's actually, quite an, like this. I mean, numbers may vary in different slabs. And India has 183 or so million families, households. This is about 240 million households. And then, uh, you know, India has what is called 1.3 billion people as its population, 240 million households. 183 million of those households, almost a billion people, are just either above the poverty line or just below the poverty line. And India's digital infrastructure this infrastructure that I showed the platform called the India stack is built to work at all layers. It is not only a digital platform and that's the key lesson. And it is enabling multiple things for startups, for businesses, for governments. And I'll give you some examples of that. What we also did along with that is that we actually clearly created a platform which was interoperable layers of um, multiple open APIs. Identity was a base. Along with identity, we created our own verifiable digital locker, a paperless layer. And I'll explain to you how that was very useful. And then of course, the payments layer, very, very famous now called the Unified Payments Interface, UPI, uh, which is now even front-ended by WhatsApp, Google, many amongst them. It's really brought down. Uh, it's really democratized payments in India. Uh, you can make a payment of up to 2000 rupees um, at zero MDR, which is zero transmission loss to both ends, to merchant and the pay. So no cost. Um, and then there is of course a data layer and a transaction layer, which, we, which, which is of less use right now in this discussion, but the three layers, which is identity, paperless and payments, and they're very, very useful. All this is public infrastructure. This is, um, infrastructure to be used uh, uh, as open APIs for, for everybody. Now, what is everybody? All, all startups, business houses, uh, governments, uh, citizens, they can all use these services. 
and uh, at most times it's free. And if it is not, it's so low cost that it's almost free. It's probably the cost of the incremental cost of um, uh, infrastructure. What this has done is the give you an example of the paperless layer that now allows us to do digital onboarding for financial services, for telecoms, for banking, um, for insurance, for, for anything you name it. And that brings down the customer acquisition cost for businesses from, you know, from, from almost uh, $20 down to about a dollar. So we have done a study which says your customer acquisition cost from $25 becomes a dollar and really becomes a digital onboarding, touchless, paperless, contactless, completely, and even presence-less. And that's what the identity layer does. It gives a presence-less layer uh, along with a, you know, EKYC. You can just do sitting at your home, multiple transactions, authenticate them, and, um, and, and you know, go ahead and do the transactions. The cost of transaction comes down. Now, and you'll sh shortly understand why this is important in the context of the digital economy, because today, every business is trying to cut costs and to digitally onboard customers, a host, uh, a skew of startups are starting offering the services. Two, for startups themselves, uh, if they want to do payments, for example, or if they want to offer EKYC services, they don't have to build infrastructure from scratch. It's all available. So uh, the way I try to explain it is the foundation layer. If you're going to build a new house, your, your, you know, your foundation is already there available to you. Not every startup, any company trying to become more digital doesn't have to build that foundation layer themselves. This foundation layer of uh, the identity of the paperless and of the payments is available to just about everybody. And uh, that brings down the cost of, customer acquisition, and then you can innovate on top of it. And that's the model of digital economy that uh, uh, you know, the country is going forward with. Uh, huge savings. I mean, if you think about uh, UPI uh, and the amount of data exhaust it's producing. Earlier, the data exhaust used to primarily go to Visa and MasterCard. Today, the data exhaust is actually in India. And, uh, uh, you know, the amount of data exhaust that uh, people are then using algorithms and AI and to, to give better credit facilities to SME, SMEs, merchants is, is now all controlled in India. So truly it's the data and digital working in hand in hand to solve some of the critical problems of credit. Um, just to give you a reference in India in less than four years, less than four years, much less than four years, probably three years, we've crossed the Indian UPI has crossed 1.3 billion transactions a month. And uh, of course, India is, you know, 1.3 billion people also. But um, the thing, uh, the important thing is, this is actually the, the top of the pyramid probably does five transactions a month. But the bottom of the pyramid also does one or two transactions every month or the other month as a household level for sure. And that is important because remittances, transferring money from one part of India to another part of India, from overseas into India. The cost of doing those remittances, especially for migrant workers, has come down uh, substantially. And uh, those are some of the very, very fast lessons I can share. Um, I don't want to cover all of this. I just want to show you a few, uh, you know, few important things. Banks, banking, we have enabled more than 380 million new accounts, uh, zero balance accounts. This could, again, a great example of digital onboarding because the cost of um, opening a bank account used to be $30 in terms of the paper filling and then KYC and you know, a lot of other checks. Today, a bank uh, can open a bank account in less than a minute in India because of the, you know, the eKYC, uh, a facility available, the completely uh, digital verifiable identity available to everybody. Um, and Nathan, I will just leave it there. The government built this up in a public-private partnership. This is not owned by a private company, this whole stack, the India stack or the Aadhaar stack. This is, uh, this is an open public good. Everybody can use it as I explained. The government, by the way, benefits every day from it. We, uh, we in the government have done um, transactions worth $150 um, uh, billion 
maybe even more now because in the last three months during COVID, this has been the platform to give out money to uh, give out money to everybody in India. 200 million households every month receive basic support from the government via this only. And that's the reason you've seen uh, people not queuing up outside on office to get their minimum, in a way, uh, <clears throat> support for income and food grains. The government has saved, if you do $150 billion, <laughs> is what we have transacted in the system. But the government has saved about $15 billion in doing so by removing fakes, duplicates, just putting the money directly into people's hand rather than intermediaries and uh, doing completely uh, you know, cashless transactions, bank, to, bank account to bank account. The cost of building the system, give or take, has been $1.5 billion. So $1.5 billion has already saved the government itself $15 billion, let alone the industry. So, you know, the ROI is quite clear. So all you VCs, you should understand the ROI in building and supporting the ecosystem from a public-private uh, partnership is immense. I'll just leave it there. Um, open to questions. Uh, any, th uh, uh, you know, any thoughts there? And I'll uh, stop the screen share. So, so Arvind, thank you for that. I think that's an amazing kind of journey that you guys have been through. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Like, first of all, how did you get involved in working with the government of India? And I guess um, one of the takeaways for you know countries like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, what would be uh, one of the key questions would be how did India overcome the political kind of bureaucracy, the legal uh, reg regulations, the special interest groups, private sector obstacles, um, and I and I think you know. And, and, and you mentioned PPP model, how do you successfully create that, the public-private partnership as well? And, and I think um, maybe important lessons for, for us. Uh, can you give us, some, give us some insight into that? See, the thing, uh, this is a very interesting question and a very important one too. So I, I you know, as Nathan in his introduction said, I have been um, for the last 25 years doing some technological disruption or the other. I was uh, a part of the team that built the first browser in the US and then I you know, worked for many, many years. I have a couple of patents in micropayments. Um, uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is very important because um, when you take that and try to apply that to, and I say this in, in a lighter vein that I've you know, done uh, entrepreneurship or startups in the US, then I did some in India. And now um, in my last role, I did one in the, in the government. The most difficult was with the one in the government. It's because the, the, uh, the mindset change is just not there. But luckily in India, at least, we have been able to push um, the government that there is, it's like innovate or perish. And in that spirit, that uh, a lot of openness from the top leadership of the country to go digital, they've understood the sometimes the resources not only lie within the government, but you have to take the best of the brains to, to solve certain problems. And it's, it's worked very well. The PPP mode has worked very well. Volunteers come in, they do certain things. Um, I'll give you another example. We just had our own contact tracing app. Many uh, volunteers helped to build it along with the government. And then we put it for open source for people to do bug bounties or whatever else it may be. Uh, but doing this disruption inside the government, the mindset change, you need huge channels. And without the existence of the champions, it's not possible at all. Uh, and we've been lucky to have champions at the leadership level, but also at some of the lateral people like me who are not bureaucrats who moved into government uh, with, with an executive role uh, and uh, solved some of those issues and pushed through some of the reform. But there have been many such people in the past. Uh, it's, it's, and thankfully, most of this is across political parties uh, it's it's been very bipartisan. Um, I mean, one of the key things, I mean, in most of when you start implementing, is uh, um, obviously the the view of politics and the involvement of politics in terms of uh, wanting to sort of digitize this. Um, what's been sort of what are some of the challenges that South Asia should really? overcome in, in, in sort of implementing this, because I'm sure you've got so much experience of things that you may have done differently. Um, and how do you get the stakeholders to come in um, on this? And how do they see the benefit? Because some of them probably don't see the benefits uh, of digitization as well. 
uh, excellent question, Nathan. I'll combine that with one of the things I forgot to answer what Jeevan uh, asked me previously. Uh, actually, the resistance from the government goes away once you you make you know this case case very clear that you invest 1.5 billion, you'll save you know 15 billion. In Sri Lanka, you know you do about 200 billion dollar, uh, 200 trillion million dollars worth of uh, uh, let's say government uh, benefit, uh, welfare transfers every every year. And if you spend $20 million in building the system, which is going to be not only only used for government benefits, but can be used for uh, for many other things, you will end up saving at least, uh, you know, saving that much of money in a year or two. And that makes the great ROI. That's how the startup thinking has to happen inside the government. But the biggest challenge, apart from the government, is, is uh, the interest groups that Jeevan asked about. Uh, let me give you an example. When UPI, the India's Unified Payments Interface, got started, who do you think it disrupted? And, and those are the card companies, the payment networks. They lose a ton of money because of that. Right? Uh, they were probably living in their own wealth also. That, you know, that's my turf. Nobody comes and takes the turf. But today, what we're realizing is everybody's come around that the market has just boomed for everybody. Of course, they are not able to make the you know um, as much of MDR, the merchant discount rate of you know 150 basis points. Everybody has to be content with 25 basis points. But the volumes have gone up. You've seen the volumes going up. It's everybody has understood the merit of that. So you know, just to you know, instead of doing a million transactions at 150 basis points. You're now doing a billion transactions at 25 basis points. So you're making a lot more money. You're bit sizing the 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 the, the value, but you are you know terabiting the uh, the volume. So that's how that's how it has to go. The biggest resistance you do get is from uh, from lobby groups protecting their stuff in the short term, but in the long run, this stuff has to get disrupted. They know this now. I mean, they, they definitely know this now. And in terms of infrastructure, Arvind, I mean, one of the key things is, um, you know, a lot of governments understand if they build a dam, that dam's going to be there for hundreds of years. If they build a road, it's going to be there for 50 years or more, and they just have to maintain it. But with digital technology, it constantly changes. So ensuring that we have the latest digital technology uh, when you start, I mean, you have to have a starting point of how to choose that technology. So what was the uh, process and how collaborative was the process of identifying the infrastructure needed for this? Now, Nathan, that's a very, very deep question for a simple reason that there is, you know, you rightly said, I mean, I, uh, technology that probably worked uh, 10 years ago is uh, going to be, uh, is going to be archaic five years, uh, could have been archaic five years ago, but certain design architectures, if you make it correct, and um, use the best in class at that point in time, I think is the way to do it. I, the, the, the big thing is, um, the question is a mindset change. I mean, within, within the community, it's, it's uh, you know, a dam, a airport, a road, everybody sees and understands. This digital infrastructure is, is so much in the, in the background that people don't understand. Give you, give you an example. You know, we've heard of, a, I don't know whether uh, most of the audience would have heard of a, a telecom company called Geo, got launched in 2016. Now, Geo is another telecom company. What, what is so special about it? It just disrupted telecom. Everybody's talking about Geo all over the world. Facebook invested a close to, you know, uh, $10 billion, uh, uh, less than $10 billion, $8 billion in Geo. Um, why? Why is that? Because it could quickly build uh, at zero friction to the consumer, digital onboarded customer, and has completely brought down the cost of uh, internet connections in India. The whole industry had to follow. And their, their total today uh, connect with the consumer is completely off, um, you know, off hand. It's completely digital. And how they used was the uh, identity-based KYC to onboard. Now, when before that, people didn't understand what this digital infrastructure means, who owns it, who don't, don't own it. They actually thought that Geo company owns this digital infrastructure as a common person. But slowly, people have begun to realize that that is how we have been able to have this near zero cost data plans. That it is because of 
this you know digital onboarding that we are able to do it so i think it's a mindset shift you need a few good bureaucrats you need a few good startup people you need a good leader if you combine this mix and great make create a jambalaya a great team uh, which can you know really push each other you'll see this reforms coming in it required and once they are there you need a few policy changes of course legislative changes but they they all follow you have to have somebody you know you know really pushing through this reform uh, and pushing the digital infrastructure we have now digital infrastructure as one of the key infrastructures along with roads uh, along with the you know health along with the schools along with everything else i mean that's the importance that we need to pay uh, if we need to compete in the fourth industrial revolution going forward as nations uh arvin let me ask actually a follow up question um by harsha from the crowd uh hi harsha um I, i think you kind of touched upon it but maybe go slightly more into that nuance because i think that initial team is very important when when uh, embarking on a journey like this right um so how did india set up that initial team um to get this program executed at scale uh did it have did it need to have the buy in of 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 the prime minister did it need to have uh, like who's buy in did you need at a, at a high level at a, a regulatory level as well the uh, multiple parts to this right i mean this is uh, explain this is stacking of multiple layers so mm-hmm. the identity layer was actually started by the previous government uh, before prime minister modi took charge in 2014 it, it actually started in 2010 11 and then mr nandan nilekani again a, a private sector person was brought in by into the government as per se the the cto uh, and the spare header of this identity program and he you know he led this he created a team again volunteers came in some governments from some from from the government some from the uh, uh private sector and um you know this program started in 2014 is when this program received uh, i mean it was just a identity platform till 2014 uh, when pm modi came in he actually fast tracked it that this should be the go to program he killed all the other parallel programs which were trying to do um, similar things and said this needs to be put all his weight behind that program the same team now um, with both little bit of private sector now because the basic architecture and all was done but a lot with the um, co-opted private sector people who are now inside the government a special task force in a way if i if you can call it um uh, has has been working and people come in and go but you set up a strong institution that that institution is um, it's delivering this whole uh, platform and um, yeah harsha you know um, again he's he's a, he's he's a, a, he's my uh, batch uh, uh, eisenhower batch so i can tell him very confidently that you know um, it is not that you need hundreds of people to solve such big problems technology gives us the advantage that if you are 30 good people you can deliver the results and uh, you know in fact my uh, my personal uh, thing to many entrepreneurs is your tech team should not be beyond 30 if you have 30 people that's 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 the benchmark i keep that if is 30 good people you can deliver projects at scale any any big project so uh, i think uh, and that team you know um, uh, comes in delivers and you once you have to solve such big problems you get a lot of volunteers country the size of india you you know we've been solving problems from a tech perspective for the world to get some few resources to come and give their 8 to 12 months um for for a mass, massive um, uh public private partnership platform uh it's not very very difficult um just one more question just to add to that n- nuance i think um obviously uh you know the team is important i think the buy in is important uh was there any other software infrastructure like um for example the data protection acts um i, I don't know you know um, i'm just i'm just trying to uh, hyperbole but is was there any other a regulation that need to be put into place to 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 get digital id going and and uh, in 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 india and that that we need to be aware of as everybody something. needs to be aware of that without regulation without policy change this most of these will uh, actually have i mean that's the counterbalance you need right the checks and balances you do, you do need and that's the advantage or disadvantage of having a public platform i mean you 
uh, while there is a little bit of regulation that governs your Google or a Facebook or an Apple, um, the scrutiny that any public platform faces is much higher. And for that, you do need to have the right regulation in place. Uh, it's a chicken and egg. What comes first, the platform or the regulation? Because sometimes the regulation will kill the platform. So innovation happens in the gray area between the space between regulation and, and the innovation. I personally feel first do the innovation, then think about the regulation around it, and then bring about regulation and let regulation follow. And, and it, would, it would follow, but let, let, you know, regulation should not stifle innovation. It should give space for the innovation to happen, and it does. I mean, you can't regulate before you have the, uh, and many countries do this mistake. They spend a lot of time um, thinking about the policy and the regulation aspects, and that's an overkill before you even build out something. It could probably have in parallel, but I would never say that first regulation should come, first policy changes should come, and then only you should start thinking about it. Uh, you'll kill the project right there and there. Well, one of the key things is um, also privacy around the world. Uh, people talk about privacy. There's, there's, there's a view that China restricts privacy uh, and is not very open. Uh, India has been much more democratic uh, in, in that sense. So was uh, the digital card or the digital ID, um, was it an issue with regard to privacy? Were people nervous in terms of coming clean um, and also being wanting to be seen in the, um, in the community? Or was that only the, would you say, a certain layer of people? So, so, uh, so uh, you know, Nathan, uh, important thing, and I'll combine it with the Harsha's question also that he has just put out again, um, is that you have to understand, fundamentally, India is a democracy, right? And being a democracy, a federal structure, we are governed by rules and rules and regulation and ordinances. Uh, I think that's an advantage. And uh, because eventually you have the confidence that the everything that we do will have to pass the public scrutiny, legislative scrutiny and the public scrutiny. Uh, so democracy helps in building these platforms, strengthening them. Uh, not the other way around. I, that's my personal view. Uh, but of course, there are different teams, Harsha. There is not the same team that builds the uh, builds the platform and also does the uh, uh, you know brings out the rules. I think um, and those are two different skill sets as it is. I mean, the guys uh, or the team that builds uh, platforms has probably very. Uh, they need to be cognizant of privacy by design and. Uh, you know, need to meet those uh, those uh, those standards. But at the end of the day, the regulation team has been, at least in India, very different from the team that has built. And, and uh, when Prime Minister Modi uh, came into power, uh, um, and around 2015, there was this whole thing about Startup India 2015. Uh, you were looking at smart cities, uh, uh, 100 smart cities uh, as a goal within five years, and you had this thing about making uh, India as a plan as well. So. Have all of those pieces also been helped by this whole infrastructure that you built? Uh, okay, so that's a, you know, um, the good part with uh, so Startup India. That's a, let me first address that because I think a lot of your um, audience today is from the startup world. Now, startups, uh, uh, as I explained, uh, if I was a startup and I was trying to do certain things, um, uh, you know, and do innovation. I, the big advantage of having public infrastructure available with me is that I could actually compete in certain areas with, with a brick and mortar company much faster because my, my go to market was, uh, you know, was much shorter. I have the basic foundation available to me because of this digital infrastructure. I'll give you, give you an example. We have a digital uh, only uh, brokerage firm called Zerodhara. By the way, not even, I don't think so, this chap has raised even a single penny of funding. Uh, Nitin uh, Kamath runs Zerodhara. It actually is now in four years or five years maybe, uh, the biggest online broker. Mm -hmm. And it competes with the ICICIs of the world and everybody else. And it's a, you know, it can offer things uh, at, at a much lower cost because the cost of doing business, the customer acquisition cost is much lower, for example. Um, uh, two, startups uh, benefit from it. There's no doubt about that. 
but the biggest benefit the startup got is that uh, is the whole mindset change in the government. Startup India program launched in January 16, 2016, uh, 2016, yeah, the early part of 2016 was uh, was to really say that you know we we want to enable startups to do a couple of things. Government will be a market for startups, so we rec recognize startups can sell to the government. As you know, Nathan, governments uh, are the biggest buyers of startup products, especially if they're in cybersecurity, defense, robotics, drones. But startups don't qualify for two reasons. Number one, age, and number two is uh, revenue criteria. And, and that's why they have to, you know, most of the startups end up partnering with a bigger company to bid for government contracts. Uh, we removed that clause. We said, you know, you can bid uh, uh, if you're a registered startup without those two restrictions. Two, so the, the M's of market, mindset change within the government, to give it lesser, you know, um, uh, le lesser compliance burden. Three, mentorship. So huge mentorship in India around, uh, around uh, you know, or for startups available. And that, is, that has really helped a lot. And lastly was the money. We actually have um, a 1.5 billion startup fund of funds. I'm part, one of the uh, committee members on that too. And mm -hmm. we, it's a 10,000 crore rupee fund, 1.5 billion, $1.4 billion given the dollar exchange rate. But uh, it, it, it is a fund of funds, which means it invests in other funds, mm -hmm. uh, which then go about and raise another 4X, 5X more than that. And the condition being that you have to invest in India-based startups. You know, and at least 20 to 25 percent of your investment should be in in registered startups rather than just you know growth capital or you know uh, private equity kind of deal. So that really enables uh, that has also enabled. So uh, for startups, the program has been very successful. We have more than 40 45 thousand registered startups right now, and uh, as we speak, we have uh, you know the government also recognizes startups are the innovation and the growth engine for a nation like India. We have, and, and COVID was, has been a very testing times uh, for all startups because of cash flow issues, for disrupted supply chains, for a disrupted consumption pattern. So um, we, we've actually uh, you know, given out a short-term loans to a lot of startups and it's part of the scheme. So you know, working capital loans, which was to an, if, if when I did my startups in India, this was, this was not existing. This was a nightmare to go to a bank and say, I have an idea. I have an intellectual property, right? Will you give me a loan against that? I mean, the bank would say, you know, I don't know which, who let you inside because we don't give money without collaterals. Um, so uh, living, having lived through that era to now this, where we are calling startups and giving out uh, working capital loans, equity, everything else. I think that's a big, big shift in in the uh, in the in the startup culture and ecosystem in India. Yeah, um, and, and I think yeah, um, you kind of hit the nail on the head again. I think we're unfortunately still stuck in that era, right? The, the whole aspect of banks um, now giving loans on just the promoter and kind of the human capital is still not happening in Sri Lanka. And and uh, when I was chairman of Slascom, we actually were able to get lobby the government and say, okay, 10% of procurement by government should be done through startups because um, uh, again, there was ridiculous kind of um, minimum requirements such as you need, you needed 20, you know, $30 million of turnover before you could bid um, um, for a government contract. And we were able to, to change that legislatively, but we, I still don't see it done in practice um, so how did, how did we, how did you get over that? It's there in the legislation maybe, but how, how did, how did you get it into practice? I, I think maybe a actually, bit more. Actually don't need legislation for this. It's a mindset change within the government also that, uh, you know, uh, failing is important and, uh, uh, startups are the growth engine. And I think it helped in the, in our case that the prime minister Modi went to Silicon Valley in sep on September, 2015. And within three months of returning from there, he understood that he needs to launch the Startup India program. So uh, I see a, a good influence of the Silicon Valley visit on the program that was launched. Um, maybe every country should ensure when they're 
where the leaders visit New York and Washington DC when they go to the US, they should also go uh, to, to Silicon Valley for a short trip and, uh, and see the energy and the ecosystem creation there or visit uh, any of the other big hubs. But, uh, you know, I, being very familiar with Silicon Valley, I can vouch for the same. Right. I think that mindset change uh, is important. Um, so India, having gone through kind of digitization, uh, obviously has hugely benefited, you know, from it. And, and, and you've shown us a couple of, of, of uh, instances. Um, can you give us a few more instances, like that example that you gave earlier, where the data from these platforms, from from you know um, this this India stack that you call it, have been used, kind of creatively to to come up with the next clever fintech, or you know um, um, cleverly have social inclusion, um, or you know uh, can can you give us a few of those examples where where there's been um, um, some interesting things that 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 entrepreneurs and startups have done on on top of the data. Uh, on, on top of this infrastructure that, 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 uh, that has been built? I will, uh, Jeevan, just say, if you, uh, let me just share this again, and I will explain to you one very interesting thing. Yeah. One of the, one of the key problems that we have been seeing anywhere in the world is loans to the, uh, to credit to the, uh, to the unbanked really. See, if you, if you were doing only cash economy, uh, you were, you had no data uh, footprint, you were not able to get access to credit at the right rate. Um, in, in rural India, to farmers, to, um, to uh, you know, small merchants, their, their interest rate should be, could be at high, as high as 36 to 50%, and in some cases, even more than 100%. Today, this new FinTech, the, the, you know, the flow-based lenders, they, uh, they can rate a person based on their data exhaust and then give them, um, an instantaneous loan, uh, uh, you know, uh, at, at rates which are much, much competitive. So uh, the credit availability and the credit rating uh, based on actual data has been enormous. I mean, uh, to all sectors, from merchants to farmers to s small businesses. Two, we've been able to host new, uh, 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 new age banks, I should call them. I mean, there is, there is the Indian, uh, you know, every country, most of us have British legacy, uh, the countries that we're talking about today, uh, they, they we used to have this very archaic, uh, or not archaic, it became archaic with the invent of the internet, the postal system. Now, postal systems either have pivoted to e-commerce. In India, we also, apart from postal system, the, pivoting to e-commerce and becoming a logistics partner for e-commerce has actually become the biggest bank in India. So now the bank comes to you, like the post person used to come to you. Now the post person carries a mobile bank and comes to you. So um, there is a lot of ways we've done disruption uh, in, in, uh, in, you know, in FinTech in credit in health, uh, the amount of, you know, and that health stack is being built up as we speak. And of course the current COVID situation has just accelerated the same, uh, but, uh, there are numerous examples today let's say and let's give you on the other side uh, how it has benefited society um, everywhere in the world everywhere in the world uh, there is a pension system and in a pension system you do what is called proof of life every six to twelve months pensioners would have to go to a particular government office and and you can you can talk to senior people in your countries respective countries you'll find that when when they would go they're wasting, first of all, travel time, their you know, travel cost, and they would go to an officer and who would, who would decide whether to give them the pension or not. And of course, when there is a human interaction, there is also a little bit of uh, possibility of corruption. And a pensioner, pensioners don't get their money so easily. Now, through this presenceless system of identity, they just give a proof of life using their thumb impression. They just give the thumb and they say we are alive and they, the money you know, gets transferred to their bank account. So this is the kind of things you can do. Um, you know, uh, the biggest thing, if, if I go back to what Harsha asked, is that we reimagined using this infrastructure, which was probably um, you know, just an identity infrastructure. We reimagined the kind of disruptions we can do with it in all facets of life. And startups were there to help the disruptions 
government is one disruptor government is a equal startup today in disrupting but then there are businesses who are using it there are society uh, social uh, you know society social society at large which is using it but startups are using it you know if there are 40000 startups today uh, i would i would say that at least 20 to 30000 of them are using some facets of the india stack in in enabling uh, their innovations whether that's the identity or the payments nothing in india no payment system in india today works without upi it has to have that option so you know that is that is the game changer that we have done and i mean if you really look at um, i mean uh, it's incredible what's happened in, especially in a large country like that and, and then you have a small country like sri lanka and, and you know larger countries in pakistan where there's 200 million of, of people in bangladesh and pakistan but when you look at what you have achieved in 1.3 billion people it, it's it's an amazing story to to be replicated so my question is when you make a system more efficient obviously people get nervous about losing jobs and sometimes uh, you know the, the creation of jobs in government jobs specifically is a massive attraction to the uh, the the old british system as you called it is is a massive uh, attraction for a lot of people so when you make it more efficient what actually happens to those people and and have you got any practical examples of uh you know this efficiency has reduced number of people or we've actually allocated them to different jobs in the government i think it's the other way around it and we have not reduced the number of people uh with especially within the government uh you know because the same people are delivering more it's the same resources delivering a lot more instead of wasting resources now you're delivering a lot more so instead of wasting money you're delivering a lot more with the same amount of money right so uh that that the, the the same disruption that the computerization did in 80s and 90s anywhere in the world this fourth industrial revolution is going to do to all of us we have to embrace it there is there is no denying that i think the the biggest obstacle is not been within the government actually probably has been initially has been the political class because the low level politicians thrive on being the power brokers a local politician a local xyz a village leader wants to control who gets the the gas connection who gets you know who gets the uh, the scholarship amount who gets the the maternity benefits uh, you know which household will get uh, the the free electricity connection that that power has gone away today the power to select and dismiss people just because they don't belong to a particular caste creed color religion whatever it may be has gone it's it's now a very very democratized uh, system so definitely we have taken power away of corruption and nepotism and from people and if that's what people want to do then they should do that as arvind a question from uh, shaista aisha from uh, pakistan uh, who's the ceo of seek ventures uh, and she's asked two questions together one is uh, what would you say were the three most important factors to consider or a work on if we were to start um, if we want to bring about genuine financial inclusion and also the second question which is probably added to that is how do we get the central bank to understand this uh, to to uh, the first one is a easier run uh, because you know um, uh, aisha is that the right way to say it i hope um, yeah uh, the biggest problem in financial inclusion is uh, is the onboarding cost you have to understand let's let's imagine whether it's india or pakistan uh, the cost uh, the average person for financial inclusion probably has in india we did a study about 130 140 dollars as their average minimum uh, average balance over the year if you take you know banks operate on something called the spread so you know if they're giving you 5% interest they probably uh, you know give out a loan at 8% let's say an average a weighted average of 8% they make 3% on $150 that 3% is 4 or $5 a year and if your customer onboarding cost is $25 it's going to take 5 years for them to even recover that customer onboarding cost they're not interested in this class of customers just because the business doesn't make sense and to make the business make sense 
you have to enable more banking, less banks, which means more technology, lower cost of customer acquisition, more lower cost of remittances, lower cost of payments, lower cost of customer, you know, uh, interaction with the bank. And that can be done through a digitized system technology only in today's world. And that's how you will lower the cost to a bank to be able to survive and serve these customers. Otherwise, that customer does not make from a lifetime value a sense to a bank, to a business. And uh, I think that that is an important thing to understand. Even if you do a policy intervention and say, hey, you, everybody needs to, uh, needs to uh, uh, support this, the government's initiative. Everybody needs to have this, uh, this zero balance bank accounts. Every bank will do lip service. They will open these bank accounts and then they will fade away. Right. To really enable them and make them alive, you need to make sure that the what, what I call the AMRM, acquisition, management, retention, and then monetization. All those four, four pillars of banking are at very low cost in a digital first manner. Now, what also you have to take care of it, and I can talk at length, is that you have to make sure that the, the technology that you are building is not a technology that excludes people by itself, by design. And uh, I will quickly show, share a screen which will actually tell you a very important aspect. India's, uh, India, what India did is made sure all its technology is built for bottom of the pyramid. And that's the reason I show that slide. Our technology works on a smartphone, but also works on a non-smartphone. By the way, that was my Eisenhower project. Uh, that's awesome. Um, I have a, a question from Madhur Naika. Madhur, thanks for joining. Um, he, he asks, it's great to, to hear that you've been an innovator on micropayments. How do you see digital payments taking shape in Asia? Who is doing this well and why? And any use cases you can share? Uh, and, and what do you need to get this done right? Well, I think uh, every country should own their own destiny. Um, India has offered help to other countries. We are ready to help and we are very, very willing to help. Just to give you an uh, example, by using your homegrown networks, my estimate is, and uh, you know, Nathan explained, I'm also a professor and I, I do this as part of my research. We, we actually save, you know, India is a $3 trillion uh, 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 GDP. 10% of transactions are happening through India's homegrown system. That's, that's $300 billion. On a $300 billion, we save almost, I mean, 100, 100 uh, basis points. You do the maths. We, we saved up to 10%, 0.1% uh, of GDP, 0.1% of GDP, that's a very huge number, by homegrown systems, by using homegrown systems. Otherwise, this money you know, is not in India, the data is not in India. So both, you save money domestically, and two, um, you, know, you, you make sure your data is available for your own uh, usage rather than and that's where your data privacy and data empowerment laws can come in because we believe that data belongs to the consumer and then not, not, uh, not somebody else. So today, if I am a consumer, I do a merchant, I do 100 transactions. That data of 100 transactions is available. I can make available to Nathan, to Jeevan, to Harsha and say, hey, you know, guys, this is my data. This is my receivables. This is how I receive payments. This is how I make payments. Tell me how, what is my best loan? So it becomes a marketplace for giving, getting better credit. But that control is with me. So today, uh, that, is, that is the one aspect. Second, who is doing it well? I think uh, India story I've already talked about. I think I'm hearing very good things coming from uh, Singapore, of course. Um, I know many countries are embarking upon this journey. I'm seeing the central bankers when they meet. In, and this year, they couldn't meet uh, in, in Washington, D.C. in the, you know, the biannual conference of uh, central bankers and finance ministers. Uh, this is a big topic. Everybody understands the value of this now, thankfully. At uh, Davos, I hear this a lot. So people are understanding the value of it, and I, I hope more countries uh, get the political will and the leadership to start moving towards this path. Arvind, um, you know, when you look at the, the, you talked about geo and how successful that was a business model change as well, but they used your system to really get there. 
Um, when you look at the mom and pop shops and the, the guy at the village who's got the shop there, how has this really changed the way that he's working every day or she's working every day? He, uh, very simple. Let me give you a small case study. He gives a small, he, today, a small mom and pop shop. Uh, his consumer uh, is this person who just received uh, uh, some money from the government. Yeah. Right? The bank is probably 20 kilometers away. Yeah. The 20 kilometers away, the bank is not going to, I mean, it's, you have to go to the bank, withdraw money from an ATM, and then probably come and pay this, this merchant. So the consumer walks in, says, okay, your bill is 250 rupees. Just pays using UPI or you know WhatsApp pay or a Google pay and done. And you can, as I said, you can still do this transaction without even a smartphone. So there right. is hard, there is, you are the authenticator. Your biometrics are your authentication. So you just authenticate yourself, you're done. You make the payment to the merchant, you go. And the merchant gets money, not in a wallet or something, in their bank account. It goes to their bank account. Uh, two, the merchants today, slightly more advanced merchants, are actually publishing their catalog on, on, on WhatsApp. And that's the big deal that has happened in India between Facebook, which is WhatsApp, and Geo, which is this company which is now digitizing merchants. That's mm -hmm. what we are seeing. Uptake of those uh, merchants has been huge. Uh, both small shops, big shops, they're all, all saying that we need to you know, publish our catalog on our on a WhatsApp link, you click there, you make your payment, and WhatsApp Pay also uh, is working on UPI only. So uh, all this is uh, is happening in real time. And I've seen a uh, personal experience, highest amount of uptake of merchants wanted to get into the digital bandwagon has been in the last three months. I, I have uh, heard you use this uh, term very uh, openly uh, many times with me. Um, where you have said that, you know, how do you create frugal innovators um, comparing, you know, Silicon Valley and, and uh, uh, India? Um, I mean, the biggest thing that I see looking at investing in companies is that companies raise, try and raise so much money and they try to build the whole system before they can actually launch and they don't have enough money to launch. So how, what are the learnings? I mean, you worked on both sides, India and in Silicon Valley, and you've done startups on both sides as well. Uh, what is a few things you could share with the audience today in terms of what you've learned? See, I think uh, the big difference is Silicon Valley looks for a problem to solve, right? I mean, they have a lot of technology. They look for a problem to solve. Uh, it's a problem of plenty. It's a new mousetrap for many, you know, many new things. Uh, in India, the innovation is frugal because it's solving a problem of people who live on $2 a day, $5 a day. So it's a very different way of thinking. I think our, my, and you know, a little bit that I, that I'm involved in the startup ecosystem, our mantra is, are you doing a lot more transactions? Are you just, uh, you know, are you, as I explained, are you looking at small uh, spread, but a larger set of transactions, which means a more data footprints, uh, you know, a larger volume of transactions, or are you looking at small transactions and trying to make a lot out of few transactions? So. Uh, the India model is, you know, you have to service all the four slabs of the pyramid. And that's the difference. The Silicon Valley model always has been top down. The, what we look at startups is that there is money to be made if you start doing, you know, bottom up, which means serve all sections of the, of the pyramid and money can still be made because your volumes will go up. Of course, the, the spread will be lower, but you'll still make a lot of money. Um, let me, I think, kind of bring the questions to the current situation, the COVID situation, uh, and I actually have probably two questions in this respect, right? Um, one thing is, um, I, I think we have a, a, a document coming out next week where we're talking to uh, regulate, regulators, uh, mostly in the government, and saying, you know, this is what the startup ecosystem needs. Um, and some of the uh, things are quite, um, requires a lot of uh, quick thinking, right? For example, one of the suggestions would be um, if startups are finding it difficult to make their EPF, ETF payments, um, is, is, is there a potential to then, um, you know, convert that into an ESOP 
uh, into the into the company instead of it going outside of the startup? And and is there a way that we can uh, regulate and, and monitor that? So let me ask: Are there any interesting uh, policy, or is there anything interesting that 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 in India has done in this in this difficult time in terms of regulation, in terms of just startups being innovative? And two, um, I think with the India stack, uh, obviously, you know, things like uh, trace tracification or you know trace, you know, uh, being able to to do trace has become quite easy. Can you talk a bit about that as well? So two, three things. The the provident fund EPF uh, employees provident fund. The government has actually intervened and said we will share the in India the way the structure is. Uh, you know, if, if if there is X amount of rupees to be paid to every employee every month, the employee contributes X and you, the company contributes X, and that's how the two X goes into the employee provident fund. Um, the uh, similar here as well. Yeah. So what uh, what India uh, the government has intervened and said for small and medium sector companies, startups, we we can contribute the 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 employee the employer part can come in from the government side. Uh, two. Um, uh, Two for startups. There is a there is uh, there is also already a relaxation that they do, if they are small size startups they don't need to even participate in that. Only more industrial start um, industrial companies, manufacturing companies will employ a certain number of uh, minimum employees. They need to be on that. Two, I think the the funding uh, which I already talked about, working capital loans, no collateral working capital loans is where uh, for startups we have intervened. And three, the biggest thing is. We have actually now, in because of COVID, come out that any uh, I'm going to give it in uh, U.S. dollars about 30 million U.S. dollars. Any government contract uh, below 30 million U.S. 20 28 million U.S. will only be bid by Indian companies. So no, it won't have a global tender. So that means companies outside India can't even bid in it. So. That is a kind of incentive to more make in India, to startups, to everybody else. That was one. That's one thing. The second thing is on contact tracing. Uh, the India stack really is because you know we want to separate the identity and because of reasons of privacy with contact tracing. It's there are two separate tracks. Um, the contact tracing has worked very well in India uh, in terms of rollout. It's the fastest uh, rollout of any application anywhere in the world. Hundred and uh, at last count, about 110 million plus uh, downloads in 40 to 45 days. So um, it's been massive, but you know, India is a big country. We still need a lot more people on that uh, on the contact tracing app. Uh, again, done both public-private partnership and in record time of about 20 days. Uh, so, uh, but but you know, and that's how you have big problems being solved. Not a huge set of people, but some you know, 15, 20 good people, they solved a massive problem. And it's it's been open source. So uh, if anybody wants to use it in the region, uh, we'll be happy to help. Uh, Arvin, that's, uh, that's amazing what, um, with regard to the regulation that you're bringing in, because I think that's what has to happen. Some of the local government business has to go to companies that are local as well. Um, and I, I think that's great that India has taken that stance. Um, I hope some of the South Asian countries also listen to that. Uh, we've got just a couple of few minutes left, uh, so um, uh, just one final question from me. Um, what does success look like for you um, with this infrastructure that you put in place um, in, in 2025? What would you, would you think that completely cashless society and is a digital cash, and you always use the word data as a new oil, um, so what is what is what are you what are your plans and what do you, what would success really be? so i think uh, you know complete uh, reimagination of many many new businesses many new ecosystems health is one education is another um, i think agriculture would be another one so disruptions uh, are not yet over we probably just disrupted uh, telecom that's a content pipe uh, we've disrupted fintech uh, finance, insurance, and banking to a certain extent. I think there is a lot of disruption waiting to happen in health, uh, with public health registries, with you know, with a with a complete digital platform for health, uh, both insurance side, health insurance as well as health, personal health, uh, agriculture, opening of agriculture markets. Um, you know, the farmer can come online, say, sell 
uh, grow in one part of the country and sell in any other part, get the best price realized. Today, they're limited by the distance of the uh, the the intermediary. So really, when when I say internet has a power to disintermediate, farmers are the can be the biggest beneficiary. So 2025, that aim of doubling the farmers' income and you know digital playing a very important role in that. Uh, that's the dream of fourth industrial revolution, and credit for all. I mean that is a, a democratized credit. I mean anybody can get credit at the rate they deserve. Today, I think that's the biggest challenge liquidity and credit for a lot of medium sectors, startups, for anybody, you name it. Um, why should be credit available to a few? And um, why should it not be democratic? Why should everybody not have access to capital and grow their businesses? Okay, this is the final question from the audience uh, from Ashwini Natesan. Uh, how are the challenges in, uh, how are the challenges in relation to data security and data protection being dealt with with the Digital India project, particularly since India does not have a, a general data protection law in place, much like the rest of the region. What are the basic safeguards in place? This is a, there are two parts to it. There is data protection, there's data security, there is data protection and data privacy. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, you know a CTO's nightmare, right? I mean, that's where you need to lose sleep and you should lose sleep because you want to make sure that security is the best. Uh, there is no leakage. There is, you know, all sorts of security in place. And this is, this is a, you know, a catch, um, a, a, you know, cat, cat and mouse game. You need to be ahead of the, uh, if you are the, you know, uh, the cat, then you need to be ahead. The mouse needs to run faster. So wh whatever that game is, you need to be ahead of the game to make sure that you um, are protecting your data of the citizens, which you have a, Kind of a you know a public responsibility very very well. Uh, there has been uh, India has actually de deliberated um, with with all stakeholders. The, one of the biggest public deliberations that has happened on data security, data protection, and data privacy. And we brought out a, what is called the DEPA, da Data Empowerment and Protection Architecture, as a law, the Personal Data Protection Law. Uh, it's on the last step of the legislation. It probably would have passed by now had it not been testing times otherwise. So we are on the final stage of the PDP bill, the personal data protection bill passing. With that, we'll have the legislative framework for all data protection and data. But our approach to data protection is very different than the European or any other approach, not like, like unlike the GDPR. We want data to be used for citizen empowerment with the right protection and right consent architecture. We believe, as you rightly said, data is the oil, right? So for that, that oil needs to be harnessed, but for the benefit of the, the, the owner of the data, not for the benefit of the platforms who gather that data. So, uh, and that's the difference. It's a data empowerment architecture, data empowerment and protection architecture. So it gives empowerment as well as protection. Um, so, so, you know, and that PDP bill is, um, it's awaited. I, I, now I don't know the time frame, but the moment we are back to normal business, whenever that is, we should see that bill coming up, and hopefully uh, that will even in, uh, enable more innovation. Arvind, I just want to thank you so much for your time, and I think we're 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 about to close here. But I think the amount of insight that you've uh, shared with us today is is amazing, uh, and I think there's a lot uh, that the other countries have to do to to catch up. Um, and we really thank you for the time spent um, uh, on, on, on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeevan. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, keep rocking. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, my next visit uh, to Colombo, uh, visit to Hatch is due. Uh, Arvind, just uh, um, I want to thank the others uh, in Seed Ventures in uh, Bangladesh, uh, Seed Ventures in Pakistani in uh, Pakistan and Hatch uh, in uh, Sri Lanka and Hatch in Pakistan as well. Uh, thank you for helping us host this event. I have a million dollar question for you, Arvind, and that's the final question. Would India be willing to license its technology to the rest of South Asia? For free? Uh, a simple answer is it's, uh, it's, it's India believes in public good. Uh, it's not licensing uh, because some of the licensing issues will always be um, being a democratic country answerable in a parliament, sometimes you can't license technology, but you can share knowledge. So we are more than willing to share all knowledge, all frameworks, 
um, and happy to help. Thank you very much and uh, lovely seeing you again and uh, uh, stay safe and wish all the wishes to your family as well. Take care. Same to you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.